Exodus 20, 25 through 26 is our opening text, reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, If you make a stone altar for me, you must not build it out of cut stones. If you use your chisel on it, you will defile it. Verse 26, You must not go up to my altar on steps so that your nakedness is not exposed on it. So today we're going to move into the next verse in our study through the Torah. I'm teaching through the Torah in the book of Exodus. Last time we were here, we were at my house having service. Took a break for Passover to teach a little bit about Passover. Now we're back in Exodus. Um, we'll continue to branch out as I go through these laws. We'll branch out into other books of the law, probably every book of the law, and some of the prophets as well. And we'll look at all of these commandments. Verse 26 is the text that we'll begin to look at today. It's not a complicated verse, but there's a wealth of knowledge that we can pull from it, understanding, information. When an Israelite built an altar on which to offer his animal sacrifices, grain offerings, drink offerings, he was not to build the altar at such a high elevation that steps were needed to reach to the top. And when we study the word altar, we know that an altar means an elevated place. So it refers to, you know, a place that is high, but not too high. Not so high as where you can't reach it. You're not to go up the steps to the altar of Yahweh. And in Exodus 20, 26, the reason that steps were prohibited had to do with making sure that a man's nakedness was not exposed. Now I want you to remember, when we cover this law... In Exodus 20, about the altars and the offerings, this law was not one that was given to the Levite priesthood, but this was given to all the men of Israel where they would build these altars on which they would offer their animal sacrifices in the places, plural, or some Bibles say every place, that the Most High causes His name to be remembered, invoked. So this is a law for all the men of Israel. I have not seen anywhere in the Bible where the women of Israel built altars and offered sacrifices by themselves. So I think the command here in Exodus 20, 26 against exposing nakedness is primarily or firstly to the men of Israel, but secondarily it stands in principle to both the men and women in Israel. So during the time that this command was given, we try to carry ourselves back to the culture of that time. During the time the command was given, men wore tunics or robes, and oftentimes they would wear them without pants or breeches as undergarments. That kind of sounds weird for us today, but we're a long ways removed from that particular time period. So it may seem weird, but that's how things were. So if a man had to climb up high steps to offer a sacrifice, the community or the family of the man that participated in the offering might see the man's nakedness. And that would turn a holy act into a lewd act. So this commandment has to do with modesty. Modesty in outward appearance. Modesty is more than just the way that we dress, but it is not less than the way that we dress. In general, modesty has to do with being humble, quiet, kind, and simple. But modesty also extends to dressing in a way that does not expose one's nakedness. According to this text, the men of Yahweh are to dress in such a way that their nakedness is not seen by others, and they're to act in such a way that their nakedness is not seen by others. Modesty in dress is not taught much anymore. It's not. Especially to men. Now, in some of the more fundamental churches, they do harp on the women. Mostly, I've heard it done in the wrong way. I've seen some churches demand that women's sleeves are supposed to reach to the wrist and the skirt is supposed to reach to the ankle. I think if us men are aroused by a woman's wrist or an ankle, it's not the woman's problem, but it's the man's problem. <laughs> Most of the time, these churches place unscriptural restraints on women. And a lot of times, they leave the women feeling like they're more of a sex object than a person in the image of the Almighty. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. 
These same churches often have men who dress in tight pants, tight shirts. That's a double standard. And it's framed from the pulpit that it's always a woman's fault if a man is lusting after her. Now, there's two extremes here that I've heard. One is that the only thing that is said is towards the women, and the women are constantly told to stay covered so that the men don't lust. We need to guard our bodies because of the men. They never place the blame on the person that's doing the lusting. On the other hand, it is true that a woman can purposefully dress, or a man purposefully dress, in such a way that they desire for someone of the opposite sex, an outsider, to lust after them. I think about where Potiphar's wife tried to seduce young Joseph. Potiphar's wife was in a position of authority and she tried to seduce Joseph and even tore his tunic and he ran. He fleed from laying with Potiphar's wife as he should have done. He did the right thing. Um, so she was in the wrong there. She lied on him. He ended up going to prison. Um, but it's also true, it's also true that a woman can be dressed beautifully, pretty, yet modest and decent, and a lustful man will still gawk after her. That's true as well. There's nothing wrong with a woman wanting to look pretty or beautiful for herself, for her husband. Nothing wrong with that at all. So I want to get away from all the modern teaching, Christian fundamental ideologies. I found more that I study the Bible, I get away from that kind of stuff, I, and I veer away from extremities. You usually found, find a balance. Uh, that's where the truth is generally found. Um, I'm not here to harp on women. I'm not here to leave the men out. I'm not here to preach church standards. I heard that a lot, the standards. We go by the standards. I heard that a lot growing up, different churches that I would go to. But then when I got old enough to study my Bible and I started building an understanding for myself, I found out that a lot of the standards that I had heard weren't in the Bible. And not just when it came to dress, but when it came to a lot of the things that people taught, a lot of the things preachers taught. So I'm not here to teach church standards. I'm not here to teach pastor standards. I'm not here to tell you a uniform that we've all got to wear when we come to the congregation of Yahweh that Brother Matthew picks out. I think sometimes preachers get their kicks off of making up rules and forcing them on everybody. I really do. I think a lot of preachers use the pulpit to bully people. And uh, a pulpit's not supposed to be a whipping post. It's supposed to be a place where the sheep of Israel are, are fed. And so that's what I'm all about. What I want to do is teach to you from the Bible that as men and women of Yahweh, we're called to be separate. We're called to be set apart. And that includes how we look on the, on the outside. Somebody says, well, my heart's right on the inside, Brother Matthew, and I think that's a great start. But the inside always flows towards the outside. Always. Outward modesty, brothers and sisters, is about honor, dignity, and privacy. Parts of our body are not meant for everybody to see. And 1 Corinthians 12, 23 in the New King James Version says, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. And in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about the natural body and also the spiritual body. And he's comparing the two, uh, the church to the physical body. So some parts we treat with greater modesty. Paul calls them our unpresentable parts. Outward modesty does not always mean there's been a change of heart in a person. You can change somebody on the outside and they can still be filthy on the inside. Um, our Messiah's greatest and strongest rebuke is probably, if I remember right, it's probably in Matthew 23. Woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. Uh, you fools, you blind guides, he calls them. He gave them <laughs> up one side and down the other. And a lot of it had to do with they presented themselves to be righteous people on the outside, but they did not have a change of heart. So you can change the outside without changing the inside. 
But I would argue that your inside can never be changed without it eventually affecting the outside. That may take time. We don't clean fish before we catch them, right? Acts 15 teaches us this, that there are some very essential matters. When people come to the faith, there are things that need to be addressed right away, right? So if somebody needs deliverance from one particular sin and they come here to the congregation looking for prayer and advice, we don't plop 613 commandments down on them all at one time. But we deal with them where they're at. And Yahweh can forgive them and heal them where they're at. And their salvation is not dependent upon full obedience to the instructions of Yahweh. Their salvation is dependent upon a penitent heart, one that asks for forgiveness and says, Father, I've sinned, created me a clean heart. I want to do your will. And then little by little, they learn to do the commandments of Yahweh. So Yahweh works on us from the inside out. Wherever there's been a change of heart, outward modesty will be found. The reason is because when Yahweh changes a person's heart, you know what He does? He begins to write His law. And it seems like every time I do a hand motion, I write in cursive. I don't know if He writes in cursive or print. <laughs> they don't teach cursive no more in school, they say. I learned how to write in cursive. Mama always told me I had pretty handwriting. It made me feel good. Yahweh's got the most beautiful handwriting. And He writes His law on somebody's heart. Somebody's inner person, little by little. It's a process. It's not overnight. It's a process. And you learn and you grow and you do better. And then you learn more and you do better. And you can only do what you know to do. Do everything you know to do. If you're faithful in the little things, it'll make you really over the big things. If you're not faithful in the little things, some people get fired from the job. Some people get promoted. Some people stay where they're at. And some people are told to leave. You only do what you know to do, but don't think that that is ever enough. Always learn better and do better after you learn. Learn and grow. Your desires change when Yahweh does this. They change toward wanting to be obedient to the law of Yahweh. This includes a desire to be obedient to the laws that deal with outward appearance. And when Yahweh deals with us this way, it means that our dress, our face, our hair, our speech, our apparel, they change. We do not desire to fit in with the world. We only desire to please our Creator. He's the only one that matters, ultimately that matters. Not the only, but ultimately, primarily, the one that matters. What this divine work, and it is a divine work, what it produces in a person is someone who thinks, acts, and looks different from the world. But it's not because you're studying the world and trying to do everything the opposite of them. It's just because you started reading Scripture and you started studying the law. And Yahweh's law is perfect. It converts the soul. You don't need anything else. It's perfect. And it makes you different. It makes you set apart. It makes you separate. So brothers and sisters, if you're in the Messiah, forgiven of your sin, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Salt makes things taste good. It's a preservative. Light makes things easy to see. You're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's what we're to be. You don't have to watch the world for anything, brothers and sisters. It's not necessary. Yahweh's law is all that you need. Sometimes people will ask me, Brother Matthew, what about this current event or that famous person or this world situation? And most of the time, I don't know what they're talking about. I say, I don't know. You have to tell me. I don't, I don't spend my time studying all that. I want to use my brain cells to study Yahweh's law. I don't have but a short time here on this earth. I want to live forever. And I don't just want to live forever. I want to have a high rank in the kingdom. There's a least in the kingdom and there's a great in the kingdom. I want to be great in the kingdom. So I spend my time studying the law of Yahweh. I had one person rebuke me for that one time. They said, you need to watch and pray so that you're not taken unawares. And I said, you're quoting that verse out of context. Watch don't mean watch the world. The word watch, the old King James word watch means to keep guard. Keep guard over the law of Yahweh for your life and obey it so that when the master returns, we're fine doing his work. Blessed is the man or woman who when the master comes back, finds the servant not lazing around, the house in a mess, but finds the servant doing exactly what he or she was told to do before the master left. And that way you, it'll never take you unawares. You always do the Master's will. 
So all I need is this book. This book keeps me informed right here. That's what I need. So I just keep reading and studying Yahweh's law. I keep working on myself. I try to be a good influence to my inner circle, my family, my friends, the church, anybody that I may run into at the grocery store, at the bank, the coffee shop, what have you. I try to be a good influence. But I remember that I only have the power to control Matthew. I can't control John out in California. I can't control Sally up in Alaska. I can control Matthew here in little old Conyers, Georgia. Used to be little old, big old Conyers, Georgia now. I can control Matthew. And by controlling Matthew, I become stronger salt and brighter light. And I influence. Not because I try to blind people, but because I try to just be a good example to them. I shine my light in the path and be kind. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4. Peter wrote this to the elders. It's, I think it's good for everybody, but specifically to the elders of the church. This is from the ERV Bible. It says, Take care of the group of people you are responsible for. They are Yahweh's flock. Watch over that flock because you want to, not because you are forced to do it. <laughs> That's, that is how Yahweh wants it. Do it because you are happy to serve, not because you want money. Old King James says, Filthy lucre. Filthy lucre. L-U-C-R-E. It means greedy for money is what it means. It says that, that's not why a preacher should be an elder. He should do it because he's happy to serve. A good leader is a servant. Verse 3. Don't be like a ruler over those you are responsible for, but be good examples to them. Then when the Messiah, the ruling shepherd, comes, you will get a crown. One that will be glorious and never lose its beauty. So, verses like this. Teach me that I'm not to force or try to force people to do anything. Um, a wise man once said that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. If a person does something by coercion or force, they're not really doing it. Because really doing something means it comes from inside. You want to do it. You don't say, oh my goodness, i got to do this again. All right. Here we go. No, no, that's not really doing something. Really doing something is, all right, it's time to serve the Creator. It's time to put on my tassels. It's time to be kind. It's time to be friendly. So it's not my job to stand up here and bark at anybody. Um, I don't want anybody doing anything in a robotic way. Yahweh wants service and worship that stems from an inward desire to please Him. Never forget Romans 2 verse 4, Paul wrote, that the goodness of Yahweh, some Bibles say the kindness of Yahweh, leads people to repentance. Oh, yes. So I think the best way to encourage modesty is to remind people of this. And today I remind you of this. You belong to the Creator. Your body is not your own. You've been purchased with a great price, the blood of the Messiah. Yahweh loves you. He wants what's best for you. Belonging to Yahweh means He gives you commands and they're for your good. They're to bless you, not to harm you, not to hurt you. The Messiah, the Son of Yahweh, He died for you. He gave up His life so that you could be forgiven of your sin and have life forever. Knowing and believing these things should cause your heart and soul to swell up with appreciation because you've seen what's been done for you, therefore you want to do back and give back to the Creator and His Messiah even when it comes to how you present yourself on the outside, not just on the inside. So this is an introductory sermon, and I plan on teaching on this subject for this moon. So that'll be three sermons total. Today is the introductory sermon. But I do want to go to the Word for some foundation for the last half of the sermon. We're pulling from Exodus 20, 26, but I want to go back even further to the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. The word Genesis is a Greek word. The reason we call it Genesis, it stems from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. The Hebrew word is Bereshith, it means beginning or origin. There's so much that you learn in the book of Genesis, so much foundation that is there, but we miss out a lot because we drive through instead of camp out. Sometimes we need to learn to camp out on a verse or verses instead of drive through them. Sometimes we need to spend years on a verse or verses, but we drive through. 
We like when I was in high school, I used to wait till the last night or two to cram for the test. Surely I wasn't the only one that did that. <laughs> and I'd memorize real quick, but then I'd forget after the test was over. <laughs> well, we want to camp out. We want to spend time and build that good, strong memorization. The first few chapters of Genesis probably get read more than most else in the Bible because people start these Bible reading programs and guess where they always start off? Genesis. So they get to read the first three chapters, maybe first 10, 11 chapters, and then they get to that list of nations there. I think it's in Genesis 11, and they bog down, and then Genesis 12, and then a year goes by, and then they're more worried about working out than they are studying the Bible or reading the Bible. Or worried about this, more worried about that. But the first of Genesis gets read so much, but I think it just gets read haphazardly and not with an intent to really want to understand what it's saying. I question how much is retained or understood when people read fast. You can read something just to be reading it, or you can read something because you want to understand it and you want to apply it to your life. That's what we need to do, understand an application. So towards the end of Genesis 2, verses 21 through 24, this is again from the ERV Bible. What we have in Genesis 2, this is building up to something, is the first recorded marriage in the Bible. Yahweh formed one man out of man. Same thing in Hebrew. Isha out of Ish. The reason she's called Isha or woman is because she was formed out of Ish or man. And then Yahweh brought the woman, the text says he brought her to the man. And this is actually, this is not part of my sermon, but this is good to say. This is actually the origin of where we get the practice of the father giving away his daughter. Right here. Yahweh was the father of Eve. Remember Eve and Adam, they didn't have any earthly parents. Yahweh created Adam from the dust of the earth plus whew, the breath of the spirit of life. Dust of the earth plus breath of life equals living soul. And then he caused this deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He took out, some say a rib, some say the whole side. Some say the DNA. And he made woman or Eve, Chava, out of man. And so Adam looked at this beautiful creation that was his counterpart, somebody that was a companion to him, similar yet opposite. And he said, according to this Bible, finally, one who is like me, <laughs> with bones from my bones and body from my body. Adam recognized he was going to be attached to Eve. And then verse 24 is actually a prophecy. Adam was a prophet. I don't know if you knew that, but he gave a prophecy. And he says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. Now remember, Adam didn't have a mother. He didn't have an earthly father either. But he prophesied this is how it's going to be. A man's going to grow up. He's going to leave one family unit. Notice the family unit is specified twice in this text. He leaves who? Father and mother. Not father and father. Not mother and mother. He leaves father and mother. Male and female. That's one family unit. And the man joins with who? Another man? No. He joins with his wife, a female. And the two become one. And the word one there is used in the sense of purpose, unity, uh, mindset, togetherness. They become a unit. And sometimes you even see men and women that are married for a long time, they start looking like each other even. They do, really. And they may say the same phrases and say the same things. And it's because over time that oneness grows deeper and stronger. That's how it should be. Thankful for my wife. Praise Yahweh. So when the father gives away Eve, or a father today gives away his daughter at a wedding or in marriage, it's, it's not an act of belittlement to the daughter. Not at all. It has to do with the father and the mother. They're concerned with who the daughter gets married to because they don't want the daughter abused or mistreated. And so it's not that the daughter has no say-so in who she wants to marry. It's just that us parents as adults, we've lived through these things and we know, look, that's not a good pick. That's not a good choice. You need to call them a little bit before you bring them to the house. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. So this is building up to what we're going to get to next because in Genesis 2.25, after this beautiful marriage... It says, both the man and his wife were naked. 
yet they felt no shame. So they walked around the garden naked. Now this is before sin enters the picture. Sin enters the picture in Genesis chapter 3, the next chapter. We'll get to that in a second. Genesis 2 is before sin. So there was something about the time period before sin that allowed people to walk around naked and there be no shame in it or nothing wrong with it. Now, we cannot apply that to the time period now because we're not in the time period before sin. We're after and in sin now. Eventually, one day, it may go back to this. Our minds can't comprehend that right now, but it might go back to how it was in paradise or the Garden of Eden, but not right now. In Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the world. I'm not going to do a whole verse-by-verse -verse exegesis on Genesis 3. Maybe one day I'll teach on Genesis 3. It's a fabulous chapter, but that's not the point of the sermon. I want to remind you of the big picture. The big picture here is that Yahweh gave a commandment and Adam and Eve disobeyed the commandment. That's the big picture. Adam was held responsible. According to Romans chapter 5, it says by one man sin entered the world. The reason I believe Adam was held responsible is because he was the head of his wife and he was also the head of creation. Adam actually was the federal head. And so in theology, I'll simplify it. Basically, it means that when Adam lost or Adam fell, we all fell in Adam. It's kind of like when David beat Goliath, all of Israel won, right? David was the one that actually beat Goliath, but the Israelites shouted and had the victory because their head who fought Goliath, he won the battle. Same thing with the Philistines. When Goliath lost, the Philistines lost. So when Adam lost or Adam failed, we fell in Adam. That doesn't necessarily mean, I think some people go too far with that, thinking that we are condemned for Adam's sin. No, I think we're condemned for our own sin. But I think the reason we sin is because we have this fallen nature, see. So we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of Yahweh. Sin has consequences. You cannot disobey Yahweh and think everything will just run smoothly afterwards. Sin is a pleasure for a season. Season can be short. So it has consequences. And one of the things that happened after man and woman sin was the realization and the shame of their nakedness, their outward nakedness. And we know this because in Genesis 3 verse 7, it says that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So the act of sin and the realization of disobedience brought upon the necessity of their nakedness needing to be covered. So they make these loincloths out of some fig leaves. Fig leaves, pretty good sized leaves, but still don't cover a whole lot. They make them loincloths. A loincloth has to do with what we would think of as a type of underwear. Now, some translations of the Bible say they made aprons. That can be misleading because aprons in the Hebrew doesn't mean like an apron that you'd put on in the kitchen to keep from getting food on yourself. It would mean more like what you think of when you say a nail apron. Uh, the Hebrew word here for apron or for uh, loincloth is kagor in Hebrew, and it literally refers to the waist where a belt is worn. So it has to do with a loincloth, and I always think of, when I read this text, I always think of little Mowgli on the old Jungle Book cartoon Mama used to read when I was a kid. So this has to do with covering up the midsection of male and female. Adam and Eve, they sewed these, these loincloths out of these fig leaves, and they covered their, their midsection because their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. But what they did was not sufficient. It was insufficient to clothe them. It was not the Yahweh ordained way to completely or sufficiently cover nakedness. It was a human attempt at covering nakedness. Now, catch this. It may have been an honest attempt to do the right thing. Sometimes people make an honest attempt to do the right thing and still do the wrong thing. And so it'd be like if you have a boss, he gives you a task, you do your best, but for whatever reason you don't have the right tools and the know-how to do it exactly right. So he comes along later and he says, I appreciate your effort, but let me show you how to do this properly. He doesn't necessarily scold you, but he gives you some constructive criticism. You just really didn't do the right thing even though you tried to. You weren't trying to do anything wrong. I think that's probably what's going on in Genesis 3 verse 7. We see that later Yahweh in the chapter covers them sufficiently in Genesis 3.21 where we read this, Yahweh, the Mighty One, made clothing 
out of skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Now, this is the foundation text for modesty in the Bible. Not that there's others. We started with Exodus 20, 26. That's a good text for a foundation. But this is the foundation text after sin where Yahweh clothes Adam and Eve. The old King James Version that I grew up with says coats of skin here. In our modern vernacular, we might think that means like we put on a coat. Well, if that's the case, then bottoms wouldn't be necessary. That's not what the text is saying. It's not that kind of a coat. Other translations say clothing or garments, but a couple of them say tunics of skin. And I think that that right now, currently, that's the best way to bring over the Hebrew word katanath into our English Bibles is tunics. Both the Amplified Bible I have on the screen and the New King James Version says tunics. The New English translation of the Septuagint gets this right as well. It says, And the Lord God made leather tunics for Adam and for his wife, and he clothed them. Also, the Lexham English Septuagint says tunics of skin. So what we have here in this case was an animal or possibly animals were slaughtered, and the skin, whether it be the hide, possibly the hair, sheep hair, was used to make tunics for the man and woman in order to cover their nakedness. You see that word made there in Genesis 3.21? Did Yahweh himself actually make the tunics for Adam and Eve? Well, maybe he did. That's what the text said, and that is definitely a way to understand that text. Yahweh himself could have made those tunics. But the Hebrew word there for made is the word asa, and it has a wide range of uses in the Hebrew Bible. And one of the ways that it is translated in our Bible is to appoint or to institute. That's two ways, I should say. Two ways that it's translated. To appoint or institute something. So I personally think that that's the proper meaning. I think it, the understanding is Yahweh Elohim appointed or instituted this for Adam and for his wife. This particular garment, this particular clothing in Genesis 3.21. Either way, the implication is that this is the clothing Yahweh wanted Adam and Eve to properly cover themselves with. Now, you can consult just about any Bible dictionary or encyclopedia, and it will tell you that this is the basic garment for both sexes that was appointed in Genesis chapter 3. Yahweh did not give Adam a three-piece suit with a necktie <laughs> and Eve a floral pattern dress. I'm not saying all suits are bad and all dresses are bad. I'm just saying that's not what Yahweh gave to Adam and Eve. He gave them a katanath, a tunic. One word describes what Yahweh instituted or appointed Asa for the man and woman. It was a tunic. A tunic is a shirt-like garment that hung, hangs from the shoulders to the knees or sometimes the ankles. I'm going to cite one reference work here in this lesson. This is the IVP Bible Background Commentary by three different scholars, Walton Matthews and Kavalis. From page 33, under Genesis 3.21, they state this, The long outer tunic is still the basic garment for many people in the Middle East. This replaces the inadequate fig leaf covering made by Adam and Eve. God provides them with these garments as the type of gift given by a patron to a client. Gifts of clothing are among the most common presents mentioned in the Bible. See Joseph in Genesis 41, 42. That's where Pharaoh gave Joseph the gold ring, the staff, and I think the kingly robe, if I'm not mistaken. And then a few chapters back, uh, Joseph's dad, Jacob Israel, gives Joseph this coat of many colors that's taken from the Septuagint. The Hebrew says a long-sleeved tunic. That's what it says actually in the Hebrew. Um, anyhow, gifts of clothing are among the most common presents mentioned in the Bible and other ancient texts. It also prepares them for the rigors of weather and work which await them. It's the end of that section from the IVP Bible Background Commentary. So it was basically a long, loose, shirt-like garment. It covered the upper body and it covered the midsection of a person modestly. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but pants hug and outline a person's midsection. A tunic drapes over it modestly. Now I'm going to go into this more detail next week and the week after. 
But I want to close today with this thought. Modesty has been defined as behavior, manner, or appearance intended to avoid impropriety or indecency. People should be able to look at us. We represent, we represent the divine name. That's how people notice us as. People should be able to look at us and know something is different about us in a good way. Before we ever speak a word, they should be able to know when we come, that's, that's a special person. That's a different person. There's something different about him or her. We should stand out in a crowd, not in a sense of arrogance or boastfulness, but in a sense of Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine among men so that others may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We should stand out in the crowd in that way. It might be said that when someone looks at us in the world, they think, that must be a religious person. Now I realize religion can be messed up sometimes, okay? But that's how outsiders say it. That's a religious man. That's a religious woman. Our appearance in how we dress should signal that we serve the Creator. Our bodies are not for each and every person in the world. They're to be kept to ourselves or if we're married to our spouse. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it day and night. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, but stay on the narrow path. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. I love everybody. May Yahweh bless you and keep you.